Welcome everyone to the Global Partnership for the Preventive Armed Conflict in the Ohio Peace and Conflict Studies Network's uh, webinar series, uh, specifically focused on higher education. And we're so happy that we have here today um, Dr. Mark Simone from uh, Bowling Green State University, who's going to share with us developing a Peace and Conflict Studies program. And um, GPAC actually is a network of um, hundreds of civil society organizations around the globe who are doing work around peace building. And there is a peace education working group that focuses on how to build capacity at scale in countries and regions of, of uh, continents around the world. Um, this webinar series is one of the efforts to help provide and help support the capacity building specifically in higher education. So thank you so much for joining us. How we'll proceed is that this webinar is, um, is recorded and it will be archived on the Ohio Peace and Conflict Studies Network's webpage. Uh, Dr. Uh, Simone will share his presentation with us and then we'll have some time for, for questions and answers. And I'll uh, happily facilitate that with us today. Um, but you will be able to access this again on the Ohio Peace and Conflict Studies Network's webpage. So thank you so much. And Dr. Simone, I'm gonna stop sharing now so that you will be able to share your screen. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us. All right, great. And uh, so I'm Mark Simone and I am the coordinator of the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Bowling Green State University here in Northwest Ohio, where it's a cold and rainy day. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul Morrow, you're our, our guest participant. Uh, yes, happy to be here. Maybe you could introduce yourself too. I am the uh, Human it? Rights Fellow at the University of Dayton's Human Rights Center and a new representative of our university in the Ohio Peace and Conflict Studies Network as of this past fall. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. So, we also had another person who joined us by phone and they're on if you'd like them to introduce themselves. They'll need to unmute themselves, so. Okay. Um, Caller, are you there? <laughs> I'm not sure how to do this. Sure. Um, Would you like if, to present? If he, or, if he or she wants to speak up, great. If not, I just want everybody to know that this is an informal discussion. I do have a sort of PowerPoint presentation to just guide me so I don't get lost. And uh, But please ask anything. Stop me at any time. And uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, go ahead and do that. Which I think then allows you to see this PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah there we, we can see it. Thank you so much, and, Dr. Simone. Okay. So um, at Bowling Green, we started our Peace and Conflict Studies program, uh, I guess officially it was in 2008, but we really started a few years before that. And one of the innovative things that we did that's been very successful for us is to use team teaching. And so I thought that that would be kind of the focus for this webinar today. And Jen seemed to like the idea. So here we are. Um, so, uh, again, I don't know uh, if this is of direct interest to Paul or anyone listening who might be in the process of developing or improving a, an existing Peace Studies program, but I thought I would go th run through some of the things that we've learned and uh, share, you know, sort of our best practices, and hopefully I can hear from you. So, uh, I'm going to give a kind of quick history about building Peace Studies and some obstacles that I think most uh, people face in doing this. And then I'll talk about our experience here at Bowling Green and what our team teaching models have been, uh, how they work, and a little bit about our curriculum. And we can uh, address any questions you have at any time. Okay? So, there we go. Um, let me move this. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, peace studies you know, is very broad and vague to most people, even those of us in, in the field. And so I just pulled this up. This is an old conceptual map from George Lopez from about 10 years ago. Um, and in fact, uh, anyone interested in starting or developing, further developing a peace studies program, at Notre Dame every summer, they have a sort of summer camp for this. And I do encourage you to go. We ended up I think we sent a team of three of us uh, to attend those seminars, right? I think it was one of the first ones around 2008. Um, 
but you know, it, it covers so many fields and disciplines, uh, different levels of analysis from you know, individual, group, nation, international. Uh, there's just so much to cover. And because of that diversity, it's, it's, it's hard to develop a program that does what your strengths are, uh, that provides good value for students and that you can sell to the administration. So, um, you know, the steps that seem to be involved from our experience and other folks uh, that I've talked to over the years, uh, usually it's the first step is you get somebody who's got this bee in their bonnet and wants to take the lead and organize the faculty on your campus that have an interest in peace. Started uh, for us, we'll, I'll get to that, but uh, regular meetings led by a historian um, who gathered at, at one point up to about 20 people to kind of talk about this and figure out how we would proceed. Um, most uh, universities have courses already on the books that are relevant to peace studies, but they may not be specifically peace oriented. And so identifying, you know, those assets are important. Um, and then you have to think about, well, okay, what is our program going to do? How are we going to develop a curriculum? And while that can take many different avenues, most folks have to deal with sort of an intro level class, um, maybe a mid-level class or just a, a menu options there, uh, some kind of a capstone perhaps, and maybe an experiential or study away kind of uh, component. Those were the things that we were thinking about. Uh, we found that naming the program was actually a big deal. And I, I think Jen could contribute here as well. Uh, we ended up choosing Peace and Conflict Studies. I kind of like the acronym. Um, but, you know, there's peace and justice studies all over the place. There, I think Kent just started something called war and peace studies. Uh, there's various names for this. Some of them don't even have the word peace in the title. And that gets to be both conceptually and politically important what you name the program. Partly it's because the students need to know what it is. But a lot of the things uh, really are key to administrators. And so we were told and we knew we faced some real problems with uh, establishing this program. Like most places, we're sort of a siloed campus. People exist in departments, which are the tenuring units. So interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary programs are kind of fall through the cracks. They don't have regular faculty. They don't uh, often aren't even able to hire faculty beyond perhaps adjuncts. Um, if they have a program, they have to beg the department chairs to allow faculty to be freed up to teach the courses in their multidisciplinary programs. So you need some support for establishing a new thing like this. First, I guess, at the chair and dean level, just that, that they're willing to kind of take a look at what you're doing and if they think it's going to be providing value for students and attract students and, you know, create synergies, they might be for it. Uh, but there's another bigger problem at sort of an upper level administration. And, and that gets to, at least for Bowling Green, especially because we're a public university, uh, you know, our upper administrators are always concerned about the state legislature. But I, I think even at private universities, there's boards of trustees and, and upper level people that worry about sort of the proliferation of programs. Uh, it seems like it, within Ohio, especially, there's been sort of a movement at the state level to kind of uh, whittle away things that are not really core. They don't, they don't like the idea of creating little boutique-y kind of things. Um, they also may have political concerns. And when you put the word peace in a class, uh, people start thinking, again, at that upper level administration or maybe in a state legislature, they start thinking about it being an ideologically driven program. And so there's plenty of evidence out there to dispel these notions. As many of you would know, peace and conflict studies or peace studies has been around really since post-World War II era in the United States. Um, there's hundreds of programs around the country and around the world. Uh, it offers every level of degree now, and it has a coherent literature, and uh, you know it, it, it makes sense, uh, but you have to sell it. And so picking the right name Sometimes you may have to compromise on the name that your faculty might want for their own conceptual teaching reasons 
in order to get this thing approved administratively. Then after you've, you, you kind of have the go ahead from the administrative level, somebody's got to do the paperwork to create all these classes and programs and get them through faculty committees and all the usual things we do to build curriculum. Um, that's a problem because uh, you, you don't want it to all fall on the one person who pulled everybody together. Uh, the other thing is that if you're going to sustain a program that's multidisciplinary where people live in different buildings and different disciplines, it's really important to build connections among the faculty so that um, part of the value for them of giving up their time away from their discipline to do multidisciplinary work is that they learn new things, make new connections, perhaps develop research and teaching uh, ideas that they hadn't been able to do before. Um, and it also then helps with a, a recurring problem that faculty come and go. And so how do you integrate new faculty into the program and how do you cope with it when key faculty take new jobs or retire? So here's our story real quick, uh, which again, every place is unique. Um, we had a history professor, Fuji Kawashima, who had been thinking about this for a long time, <laughs> decades, and finally got the ball rolling in the early 2000s, uh, gathered together faculty from all over campus, not just from arts and sciences, but also education faculty, uh, initially some business faculty, someone from technology. Uh, you'd be surprised sometimes uh, by the interest this might generate. And it's often difficult to locate uh, people that really do have the interest, but just, you know, if you look on their webpage, you wouldn't see it. Um, so he started with this group and we had a series of meetings and started talking about it and developing ideas. And then uh, we got lucky. So uh, the picture there is me with um, our major donor to the program, uh, Ms. Hiroko Nakamoto, who herself is a Hiroshima survivor and attended Bowling Green State University back in the early 1950s. Uh, and it's just been real supportive, mainly focusing on uh, School of Art and Asian Studies, uh, you know, in, in the gifts that she's given. But because of her personal history with the bomb, um, she was very interested in peace studies and Fuji talked to her and eventually got her to commit to a fairly large gift, at least at our university, uh, to support the idea and the creation of peace studies. So that really helped a lot with the upper administration because now we've got a donor that's willing to help. Um, that money didn't end up being crucial. It was much more the signal that a donor cares about this. The next thing that Fuji did, which was very strategic, uh, so partly because of Ms. Nakamoto's uh, ongoing presence, we have a, a summer program that takes students to Hiroshima. At that time, it was mainly Asian studies students. Um, there are two programs there. One is a sort of all summer language focused program, but the other one is much more focused on the bomb and peace. And so we have a sister university that hosts our students, that arranges families for them to live with while they're there. It's about a 10 day trip and it covers the August 6th period when there is the annual ceremony marking the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima. Um, and then, so what we have is a series of seminars with Japanese students. It's, it's an all women university, Hiroshima Jokokuin. So, um, but we interact with them and it's all in English, which is very <laughs> helpful, especially for people like me who speak no Japanese. Um, anyway, uh, back in 2004, Fuji invited the president of our university at the time, Sidney Rabot, to come over to Hiroshima while this seminar was taking place to meet with Ms. Nakamoto there and just to see what we're doing. And I don't know all of the details of this meeting, but somehow in visiting some of the sites in the Peace Park and other cultural sites, he had sort of an epiphany and said, you know, we teach a lot of courses on war here at Bowling Green, but I don't think we teach any on peace. And so they, that's when we really sort of pitched the idea to him and he was all for it. So, you know, once you get the president of the university on board, then you kind of have the administrative cover and we knew everything was going to go well. So 
I would say to others who are thinking about these things, you don't always have to have a, a donor or a large donor, but somebody outside, alumni or other stakeholders really helps. And then it's, it's really nice to at least get the president. I mean, we were lucky because Robo became sort of a booster um, and we knew that we wouldn't be having trouble with the state. Uh, but if you can at least get the president to buy into it or the provost or key administrators, that's important. So one of the things that we thought about was given the nature of our program and its existing links with Asian studies and this Hiroshima trip, that maybe we should come up with one of our new classes. Of course, we had to do an intro and, and some other things, but it was something called uh, Peace and Cultural Legacies of the Nuclear Age. And we envisioned this as a team taught class. Um, and really, I, to my knowledge, there really been nothing kind of like this done on the university in the past. So this was sort of a new concept. Um, immediately, of course, we run into the, the, the struggles with team teaching. Um, team teaching is really helpful, I think, in peace and conflict studies in particular, because the, the field is so broad. You've got domestic and international components. You've got dozens of disciplines. And the existing courses that are there often cover the war and violence and conflict analysis, but they don't focus much on how to achieve and preserve peace. Um, so even if you have people that have taught this stuff, they haven't maybe really even learned um, the sort of peace approaches to these things. Uh, the other thing is we, we found, uh, not initially, but eventually we've had to hire adjuncts to teach our intro class often, or we have a faculty member who's interested in doing it, but you know, they're a philosopher or historian or uh, an education scholar, and they really only know a few areas of the field. Um, they don't know the whole field, and really the kinds of textbooks that are out there, I think that's changing some, but there, aren't, there isn't like a standard intro to peace studies book that everyone agrees on that covers, you know, 10 topics that anyone can cover by reading the book, right? So, so there's a real sort of continuing education issue that, that comes up. Um, so what we decided to do was to develop this course um, and we wanted to get a lot of faculty involved. Now team teaching runs into this major hurdle and Paul or Jen and, uh, or others, feel free to jump in and tell me your struggles with this. But, you know, the problem is how do you get credit for it, right? If there's two people teaching the course, which, you know, the administrators say, well, we, you can't both get credit or more, right? So, I mean, one model is to have lots of guest lectures. There's sort of one instructor of record, but you have faculty kind of drop in and teach something in their expertise, but they just show up once or twice and then they go. Um, that can work out because most faculty are willing to do this for a topic uh, and a group of people they care about. Um, another model would be to have maybe two or three faculty, and we've tried this with our intro class, sort of teach two, you know, each, uh, each teach a major section of the course. So if it's two faculty, each one would teach eight weeks. Uh, they'd be basically responsible for everything going on in those weeks. They do all the grading and then it would switch. It's, it's almost like having two classes in a sense. Um, what the result is that workload is fairly equal. Each person sort of taught half a class. And so uh, sometimes department chairs and deans are able to finagle that so that if you teach the same two people, teach it twice, each one will get one course credit for doing that. And they don't feel like they're teaching an overload. Well, of course, we were trying to get sort of a real team together and, and make this be something where it wasn't just, I, there's a word for it, but you know, sort of tag team teaching where you just, you know, there's somebody in the room all the time, but it's not multiple faculty. We wanted to have multiple faculty there um, because we wanted faculty to learn from each other and to contribute to the discussions from their disciplinary perspectives. And so, uh, the big problem here was, yikes, and it turns out the, the first time we did this, we had eight faculty plus the instructor of record, so nine total. Uh, who gets the credit for teaching the class, right? Well, we got kind of lucky, and it's partly because of the donor, but um, 
So what, what ended up is the dean at the time decided that as a way to promote the program development uh, models for you know uh, developing new curriculum and other things, uh, he was willing to pay all of the, uh, in fact, the eight faculty members who were not the instructor of record, the equivalent of about a, a course overload, which was about 1500 bucks a piece. And at the time, they were they they gave us the option of taking that in income or in like professional development, which was very attractive, especially for younger faculty who need more money to attend conferences. Um, but that was a really nice deal. Um, what what we did with that was we were able to have I would think the deal was we would have at least four faculty members in every class, and uh, we organized the syllabus, which I'll get to in such a way that um, the topics melded together, that it wasn't just sort of, okay, this is Jane's class and that's Joe's class, uh, and they'll do sort of the lecture discussion or whatever pedagogies they want. Um, we would break a, we, we would meet, one year we did it one night a week for three hours, so that was very easy, uh, but usually a Tuesday, Thursday model with 75 minute periods but they would be broken into sections. And so we might have two or three faculty taking the lead at any point in the class, but the others were there in the room and they would discuss. And, and it was really a neat system. Um, I would say this too, that early benefit of the money was helpful. Uh, the, our university over the last 10 years is slowly moving towards sort of a banking system where we can kind of keep track of not just this sort of team teaching, but even guest lectures and that they haven't developed a set of rules that are uniform, but each department gets to sort of decide how much do you have to bank until you can get a course release. So that's another model. And I'd be curious to hear if there are other models and issues out there that are coming up uh, that other universities have come up with. So the class we taught it basically it focused on Hiroshima. It started, starts with Hiroshima. Uh, actually, it starts with the core concepts in peace and conflict studies, positive and negative peace, direct cultural structural violence. Um, but we start with Hiroshima. We usually start out with uh, survivor stories. Uh, we use a lot of films. Uh, the core faculty in our group have predominantly been more social science oriented than cultural or humanities oriented. So uh, we've always tried really hard to make sure that there's cultural uh, analysis going on. And part of the way we've done that is by using a lot of films, uh, including not only documentaries like some of the ones listed, but uh, we watched you know, Godzilla, the original Japanese Godzilla movie, which really links well with Hiroshima. Um, we watch things like Dr. Strangelove, Atomic Cafe, uh, and other stuff like that. So um, we developed a sort of first eight weeks of the class dealing with the, the atomic bombing, the history of the bomb, the science of the bomb, uh, the ethics of the bomb, and then sort of the beginnings of the Cold War and deterrence and nuclear deterrence. And then we move on to, I, I don't really have a name for it, I'm just saying extended topics. So this is where we bring in more people and it's really helpful when we, we, we kind of hear of somebody, oh, you know, so-and-so does, you know, Native American lit, but they, they've got an interest in this stuff, you know, that you might talk to them. And so what we'll do is design the syllabus each year and try to recruit people to come in and tell them, hey, you know, if you have anything that you do that's related to peace studies uh, from whatever perspective or topics that you're interested in, we'd love for you to come in and teach a class or two with us. And so you can see there's a, I've tried to list mainly from memory, but I pulled stuff off of syllabi, some sort of, you know, sampling of the kinds of topics that we've done. And some of this stuff segues really nicely with the emphasis on nuclear issues and atomic bombs and stuff. Uh, for instance, the Native American guy did talk a lot about, um, uranium mining on reservations and how that affects, how that's affected the Native American culture in the U.S. Um, but we've had stuff off, you know, out of the blue too. We, we had a, a guy here for a while who was really into meditation. He was a philosophy professor. And so 
you know, he would talk a little bit about the theory of, of meditation and connection to religious practices and things, but we spent several classes leading the students in actual practice of meditation and reflecting upon that. And what was so neat is that because there were four other faculty there too who knew very little about meditation at this time, um, when the students were kind of faced with, wow, this is really different and it was hard to get them to talk, you know, the faculty would jump in and ask all kinds of questions and, and come up with links to things that we had covered or were about to cover. Um, so that, that's really been neat. Um, and it's also been, you know, really helpful for me in understanding how to teach something because I'm a political scientist. I'm social science oriented, very data oriented. Um, and teaching topics that involve film um, and or the or literature um, and that don't involve necessarily a lot of data or something like that. that's a, a little tough for me sometimes. And so it's been really uh, beneficial to my teaching overall to see, you know, we had a faculty member from German come in and talk about immigration. We used a German film from the 70s to uh, deal with this and, and all kinds of sort of humanistic approaches that can be used to teach. And, and it's, it, it's really helpful because for me, it's like if I can see someone else do these things maybe twice, the third time I can do it by myself. So um, what's ended up happening is we don't have eight or nine faculty doing the class right now. Usually it's about four. And one's the instructor record, three of them are contributing. They're there, usually not together, but sometimes uh, they are. Um, and but whoever and the instructor of record will rotate around. So um, there's probably been six or seven different faculty members in our group who've taught the class as the main instructor, and then they get to see uh, you know, again. Usually not just one class, but a week or two weeks of somebody else teaching a different topic that they're not that familiar with from a different perspective using different teaching methods. And it, it just been really, really positive. We get to know each other personally. We have to plan these things together so we meet more. And, um, you know, I've just learned a whole bunch of stuff that's helped me in both my teaching and research over time. And I think a lot of the others have too. Uh, you know, to the point where, you know, we have retired people that want to still come in and, and teach if they're in town. Uh, we've got faculty who were faculty members who've become administrators who still want to do a couple of classes for us every semester. And um, it's just been a really good way of creating that sense of not a department, but that we are a group. We are, you know, united here and, and there is a real program and we have real students and we know each other. Uh, and we're not just all sitting in our departments just showing up for a class now and then. So. Um, just so you, if anyone would be curious, in our, our university, we, we only have a minor in peace and conflict studies. It started that way. We thought, well, if it grows, great, we'll do a major. But um, we basically have the intro class, uh, this team taught 3000 level class, uh, a choice of a couple of upper level classes that are more skills oriented, conflict resolution, communication conflict. And then we require some kind of a study away or an internship as an experiential component. Then we have three courses from a list of things that we think are relevant to peace and conflict studies. The other thing that's happened along the way is that um, as folks have contributed to our class, our team talk class, they've often gone back to their disciplines and taken a class that they've already taught or that uh, in a couple cases, totally new classes and, and really created a nice mid-level peace and conflict studies class for us. Like we now have a class called philosophy of war and peace, for instance. Um, you know, we, we always encourage people to do this. Uh, the idea being that like on our list of courses, we have all of the history of war classes, right? But getting a faculty member to participate and then having them change their uh, war class on World War II, Civil War or whatever, to talk about the peace building processes and peacemaking processes that were involved in that. Uh, conflict that they might not pay as much attention to that makes it more of a true peace studies class for us and so we're really happy with that 
Okay. So that's where I am. And I don't know, Paul, or anybody else online, I'd be happy to talk to you and answer questions. Um, again, this is my first time with this technology. So Jen, <laughs> tell me what I need to do if there's anything. Uh, okay, you're good. You're good, Mark. Why don't we go ahead and leave that slide up with your, your email address there. And um, we have uh, folks from Serbia, Switzerland, and uh, Paul from Ohio on right now. Again, for uh, those who joined us a little bit later, this webinar will, uh, is being recorded and it will be archived both on the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflicts webpage and also on the Ohio Peace and Conflict Studies Network webpage. So after we take a few questions, I will share um, where you can find the next uh, in the series as well. So why don't we go ahead and take any questions or comments um, from those of you who are on. You'll need to unmute your microphone if you'd like to um, share. One of the things that Mark um, had mentioned was about, you know, how do you prepare your faculty? One of the things that some of our colleges and universities here in Ohio have done is that they have now included, because we have so many people in the United States now with masters or PhDs in peace and conflict studies, is that becomes part of the requirement um, or um, preferred qualifications for hiring, for adjuncts or for faculty members. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, um, one of the colleges and universities, Cogna Community College, for all of the faculty that would be teaching any of the um, courses, they were, were asked, because they could not require it, but asked all of those faculty to go through a two-day workshop on those topics. So those three core, one was conflict resolution skills, one was on the theory of peace and conflict studies, and that was um, facilitated by actually our partner, Kent State University's Center for Applied Conflict Management at the time. And um, he had his PhD from George Mason, Dr. Landon Hancock, and was able to provide a two day at a higher level theoretical um, overview for the faculty. And then there was um, a one day that was conducted by the Ohio Campus Compact. And what they do is because the third required course was on applying the, the, the skills and the theory out in the community, Ohio Campus Compact, which is the state experts in how to integrate um, service learning is what we call it, into your courses, did a one day where faculty brought their um, syllabi uh, for the courses and how they could integrate those core concepts in there. So that was a great um, opportunity. And even though it was not required, every single faculty member went through those voluntarily, which was wonderful. And, and part of that reason was so that as each of the faculty got students from the other classes, as each of the classes were to build on each other, they had the same kind of basic knowledge of what the students had received before they came to them, which was really helpful. Um, and then we'll, um, for those of you who are on the call that are interested in looking at some of the different syllabi from different colleges and universities, undergraduate and graduate level, the Peace and Justice Studies Association has actually compiled hundreds and hundreds of those that faculty can take a look at if you are a member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association. So you could join there even as an individual um, and you can do that online and then you, you would have access to those. Uh, and the last thing that I wanted to share with you too was the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Uh, we had a webinar from them yesterday for faculty. They offer research grants and there are some coming up right now for faculty. They also have a lot of um, their resources are free and online in more than 70 languages. And you can um, utilize those in your classes for teaching around um, civil resistance and nonviolence. So that might be of interest to those who are on the call. So who, um, let me ask Paul, Paul did have a question. Paul, if you want to unmute, and then we'll ask for other two guests who would like to also ask a question. Sure. First, thank you, Mark, for that presentation. It was fascinating, and some of the discussions I've been in around human rights studies programming here is right. really a comparable thing. structure, getting people yeah. on board. I have a question specifically about pedagogy when you were developing the course, and mm -hmm. you talked a lot about the value for the different faculty members who sat in on the course when it was first being developed. 
how did that affect the dynamic with the students, with the undergrads who are in the course? So I can imagine you've got four professors in your room with you. Um, I speak up. Did the professors have some unwritten rules about stepping back a little bit? Yeah, you're, that's a very good point because uh, we were lucky, I guess, we had gotten to know each other enough beforehand that we kind of unspoken, uh, we had an unspoken understanding that the professors would not dominate the course in the mm -hmm. discussion. It was, it's more that uh, we sort of let the students to go first. Uh, if there was a lull or if there's something that you're just itching to talk about <laughs> or a connection that isn't being brought out, then the faculty members contribute. Um, we probably should have actually said that formally amongst each other, but that, that norm kind of held. Uh, but you're right, that's, that's the problem is that uh, it's like teaching a class with graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, sometimes the, the discussion gets a little too high level um, for the faculty members, but uh, we also often taught the class in the evening and so afterward people weren't busy and so faculty could kind of continue their own discussions afterward. That helped. And did you get any feedback from your student evaluations? Like, were there surprising things they really liked about that model? Did they say this is great, actually? You know, we get really positive evaluations, but I think it's partly because we have really well qualified, good teachers who do the class. Yeah. Um, I don't know that this, the students often will say, wow, this was really great, um, but not always. And the other part is when you evaluate team teaching, it's tough because, you know, if you're only, you're the instructor of record, we, the way our system works, you can only do one set of evaluations. So it's, you know, the instructor of records getting evaluated, but really the students evaluating four people maybe. And, you know, if there's a few weak links in there, or they didn't like one section of the course, that can bring the averages down a little bit. So there's a little struggle there. I also think students are not as aware of the potential benefits of studying a single topic from multiple perspectives. So we try to sell that a bit, but um, I don't know. But one thing that's happened is that a lot of times faculty will kind of come in with their sort of greatest hits lecture, you know, that they've got a section like one guy's, you know, I do this propaganda thing, it really works well. Mm -hmm. So the students are getting really good classes and they're interactive and they're challenging. Um, we do a big debate about the ethics of Hiroshima that usually goes pretty well. Um, anyway, so that helps, but that's another, you know, there's so many administrative hurdles dealing with team teaching. So the Corsi Valley issue is another big one. Thanks. Thanks uh, so much. Um, our, we have a couple of other guests with us. Uh, Tatiana Popovic from the Nancy Dialogue Center in Serbia. And mm -hmm. we also have a guest, I believe, um, from the University of Switzerland. If either of you have questions, if you want to just unmute your mic and ask uh, Mark Simone and or share your own experience with this, would be we'd, we'd appreciate that. Right, I would love to hear, uh, especially in the international context, um, any issues that come up in trying to start or build peace studies because you know it's very different I think in the United States from other places. Great and I just unmuted both of you so if you'd like to, to either share your own experience and or to ask a question that would be great. Please do. Maybe there are no questions there. Wow. We have some technology Dr. issues. Or I'm sorry, Ms. Popovich, we actually cannot hear you. Um, it makes your voice sound like Mickey Mouse. I'm not sure why. <laughs> no, it still sounds like Mickey Mouse. It's really hard to, to hear you. I'm not sure what's yeah. going on. Well, that must be the, the connection somehow. But, you know, um, Tanya, if you go down to the chat button, like if you move your cursor around the chat and, and type in, your question or comment then I'm happy to read that out to the group um, mm -hmm. and in the mean, yeah I'm sorry I don't know why it's making your voice different um, 
if what? Tatiana is from Serbia, um, I would mention that uh, I, I do know of a colleague at, I think, Clemson, who they have a really nice study abroad uh, program in Belgrade. And I know there's a lot of opportunities around the world uh, to take students. And, uh, you know, if you're a university that wouldn't, would be interested in hosting uh, this idea of a sort of short term trip, not, it doesn't have to be a whole semester anymore, I mean, two weeks, one week. Um, it is so eye opening for our students to, to be in another culture and to learn about some of the issues that they've dealt with related to uh, peace and conflict. And, and so, um, big Mark, issue so there were um, actually both, both of our guests said that oh. there weren't questions. Um, but they wanted to thank you for the, the excellent presentation. Uh, oh. And uh, Tanya Popovic from Serbia said that there are peace studies at the Faculty of Political Science, and she'd be happy to organize an exchange, and we can put you two in touch. Um, I use your email's right there, so she'll be able to get that, or I can put you two in touch, um, because Tanya is uh, a co-chair of the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflicts Peace Education Working Group. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. So they do some great work there um, and have for decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tanya, um, great, thank you. So um, what I'd like to do, if it's all right, then Mark, if there aren't additional questions, is, um, would you like to have any closing comments before I share a couple of resources online? No, I guess I'll just thank Paul and the other participants for, for attending, and I hope that um, we can kind of continue addressing these sorts of issues in the Ohio Peace and Conflict Network and other venues around the world. Great. Thank you so much. Um, what I'd like to do now is just share with you a couple of things um, from the... Uh, from the website that might be some resources that might be helpful for uh, some of you, actually, is the Ohio Peace and Conflict Studies Network's webpage. And just a moment, I'll bring that up. So that you can also see where some of the resources are, um, some of the upcoming webinars. So just a moment. Just pulling it up here slowly. It might be the technology today. This is what you'll edit out, right? <laughs> right. This is, this, this is what this edit out. All right, great. So let's see. All right. Let's see if it'll pull it up. Ah, there it is. Yeah, there we go. You see it yet? Mm -hmm. It just looks white to me right now. Oh goodness, well, this will be the part that gets edited out, um, apparently. <laughs> Not sure why, I think there are technologies just, there we go. So um, here is the web page for those who are on. And uh, if you go here to resources, the right hand side, and you click on the webinars here, you'll be able to go to, it seems like it's really slow, but you'll be able to see the upcoming list of webinars that we have. Um, and these webinars are presented primarily by colleges and universities in the state of Ohio that have peace and conflict studies programs. And here's the list of the past and upcoming. This will also be where as soon as we have the edited um, webinars, you'll be able to click on the webinar here with the past dates, and you'll be able to access them. So none of those are uploaded yet, but by next week, we should have those sometime next week, and then you'll be able to access them. The, the next one that we have coming up is actually on the 27th. Um, and so if we click here, um, a need for critical peace education. Um, and this one will be done by the University of Toledo. So of the 52, about 52 colleges and universities that we have um, in Ohio, the four year and a plus, the majority of them have a peace or conflict studies certificate, concentration, and degree. 
And so they'll be delivering different, they each have their own expertise in their different departments from political science to education, et cetera. And um, you'll be able to hear a little bit more and learn from them. So this is where you'll be able to click on and then you'll be able to register uh, for each of the, the workshops. And then we'll have the following will be the Lion and the Lamb Peace Arts Center. And that's about how to integrate peace and conflict resolution um, into literature and uh, reading for young people, for children. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for some of those additional webinars. Uh, the last thing, if it, if it will come up here, that I wanted to share. is um, our speaker yesterday was from the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. So if you're looking for resources, this is a great place to go. And in fact, one of the uh, case studies that he shared briefly about was Serbia, also Ukraine. They have resources in multiple languages and they have grants for faculty to develop courses and to do research on nonviolence. So this is a good, good place for folks to go. And they actually support faculty all over the world. So the next uh, one that you might be interested in before we close is the Peace and Justice Studies Association. Uh, while I think primarily the faculty are from North America, there are additional faculty from all over the world that are members. I'm just pulling this up here for a moment. Pull up. And this is where if you are a member, you'll be able to access hundreds of the um, syllabi that were donated by faculty from across the United States and around the globe. And those are some of the resources once you're, once you're a member. So there's membership and here's some of the publications um, that might be of interest to you uh, and, and some of the resources. So over here you see resources that are exclusive to members and that's where they have the job listing, um, the syllabi repository, which is uh, one of the things that I was just mentioning. So another good good resource tool for those of us in higher ed around the globe. So I want to thank uh, Mark again um, for taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. I want to thank GPAC for helping to support uh, our work um, in, in the field here. And uh, any closing comments, thoughts, or questions from Mark, Paul, Tanya, um, or our guest from Switzerland? No, Jen, I just want to say thanks again to you and to Paul, especially for uh, joining and, and, and as well as the others. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you organizing this and making them available on recording versions so that we can use this as a resource. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and hope you'll join us for another one soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.